Hello, I'm Monse Alvarado. EWTN News In Depth is next. We're the ones that pretty much bring the Catholic faith to our reservation. A minority within the Catholic Church in America, Native American Catholics, will explore this unique group of worshipers and the church's growing recognition that more needs to be done to support them. We talk to the bishop who leads the U.S. diocese with the largest number of indigenous Catholics, what the Catholic Church in Gallup, New Mexico, is doing to keep its parish community strong. His life started in a Chinese detention center. He eventually came to the U.S. for his education. A Uyghur American shares his insights into the persecution of China's largest ethnic and religious minority. And the announcement of the Biden administration's nominee to become the next U.S. ambassador to the Holy See gets a mixed reaction. We'll explain. EWTN News In Depth starts now. I was raised in our culture. I was raised in the Catholic faith. Um, we attended, um, you know, sun dances, powwows, you know, ceremonies. Growing up, you know, we took part in all of this, but then we also went to church on Sundays. Catholic religious minority in America, indigenous Catholics. More than 500,000 strong living mostly in the southwestern United States. Proud of their history, their culture, and their Catholicism. Yet at times misunderstood and at times hurt by the very church they call their spiritual home. Hello and welcome to EWTN News In Depth. This past Monday, the U.S. commemorated Columbus Day, a federal holiday established to celebrate immigrants and a point of pride for some Italian Americans. But around the country, the presidentially proclaimed Indigenous Peoples Day was also celebrated. As we think about the people who originally inhabited North America, many of us don't realize that a significant number of Native, Native Americans are members of the Catholic Church. Today, we explore the history of their faith formation and some challenges they faced, both past and present. Reporter Mark Irons begins our coverage. Catholicism has spread to all corners of the world and to all peoples. As early as the 1500s, the faith was brought to Native Americans by Catholic missionaries from Europe. Now, according to recent numbers from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, there are more than half a million Native American Catholics. This week, as some communities around the U.S. celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke about some of the struggles Native Americans face. Native Americans are more likely to live in poverty, to be unemployed, and often struggle to get quality health care and to find affordable housing. The reality of the present follows fresh reports of abuse in the past directed at indigenous populations in North America. Earlier this year, hundreds of unmarked graves and the bodies of indigenous children were found throughout Canada at historic Indian residential schools, active starting in the 1800s in Canada and the U.S. They attempted to assimilate indigenous populations. The Catholic Church played a role in some of these schools' founding. Like our parents have gone, you know, was in a boarding school, and they had a great experience. They were they were actually happy and glad that the that the uh, Jesuits had come and, and educated them. So ben and Jennifer yeah. Black Bear are Catholics and Native Americans of the Rosebud Tribe in South Dakota. They hear mixed stories, good and bad, from people who attended boarding schools in the United States. But they've been calling for an apology from U.S. bishops, saying it would bring healing to reservations across the country. We know we can't change the past of everything, you know, how our people have been affected by this, but um, an apology, you know, we asked if there would be an apology. Last month, bishops in Canada apologized for the role some Catholic religious communities and dioceses played, participating in the boarding system that led to suppression of indigenous language, culture, history, and tradition. The bishops write, we acknowledge the grave abuses that were committed by some members of our Catholic community, physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, cultural, and sexual, and we are fully committed to the process of healing and reconciliation. In 1987, Pope John Paul II addressed Native Americans during a visit to Phoenix, Arizona. Speaking about the early European movement to North America, he said, the cultural oppression, the injustices, the disruption of your life and of your traditional societies must be acknowledged. He added there were positive contributions as well. The now saint said, I wish to recall the work of the many missionaries who strenuously defended the rights of the original inhabitants of this land. From within Native communities have come stories of great faith. In 2012, St. Kateri Tekawitha was canonized as the first Native American saint, and there are ongoing causes for canonization of the La Florida Martyrs and Nicholas Black Elk. 
but there's growing awareness that the church can do more. This year, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops voted to create a pastoral plan for Catholic Native American ministry. They noted that currently there is no guide for understanding or promoting this type of ministry in the U.S. church. It's almost like we're forgotten. It's like we're all forgotten. And not just speaking like for our tribes here in South Dakota, but I think nationwide that they forget that, you know, Native American Catholics are still here. Ben and Jennifer Black Bear work with the St. Francis Mission founded in 1886. They say they need more support, and it pretty much falls on their shoulders to bring the Catholic faith to their reservation. Church missions like theirs in South Dakota can be found in other parts of the country as well. In his 1987 address, Pope John Paul II also spoke about the good work of missions throughout the southwestern United States that improved living conditions and set up educational systems for Native Americans. The work continues today. The principal of St. Francis School in Lumberton, New Mexico, says she sees signs that the faith is growing on the Icaria Apache Nation. I've seen more people this year want their children to receive the sacraments than I have, I think, in any previous year, which to me is a healthy sign that the gospel message is being heard by people on the reservation. Mark joins us now on set to give us the personal side of this story. Mark, you actually worked in a school on a reservation in New Mexico. Right. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. Well, Monty, I did teach at St. Francis for a year, and from my perspective, the school really provided a close-knit, faith-based family atmosphere for the children coming off the reservation. I mean, the reality is there are struggles on Native American reservations. There's high rates of alcoholism and suicide. And so I think to provide that stable Catholic environment where children could come, and as the principal said there, encounter Christ and even in the sacraments. I think that's a, that's a great thing, but it's not just what the church provides to Native Americans. I think it's what they also provide to the church, you know, the beauty in their life and their traditions and their culture. And so I think when both of those sides can come together, it's a positive thing. And that's the experience I had. Do you think we're walking in that direction as a church? I think so. I hope so. And, you know, to hear some of those stories, uh, especially, you know, from these schools that are continuing these missions that started long ago, sure, there's issues from the past, but I do think we're growing and healing and hoping moving in the right direction. I hope that we are too. A large percentage of Native American Catholics live in the Southwest, and within that region, many are concentrated in the Gallup, New Mexico diocese. Joining us now is the leader of that diocese, an Arizona native, Bishop James Wall. He understands better than most in the Catholic Church both the opportunities within the indigenous Catholic community as well as the historic challenges its members face. Bishop Wall, thank you so much for joining us. Your diocese has more indigenous Catholics than any other in the U.S. Give us a brief historical overview of how Native Americans came into the church and how specifically your diocese, the Gallup Diocese, has ministered to them over the decades. Sure, we have the, the highest percentage of, of Native Americans of any diocese in the United States. It's a unique diocese in that it's in, it's in two states. And the reason for that is uh, uh, Pope Pius XII established the diocese. Uh, but one of the recommendations of St. Catherine Drexel is very important to us. Uh, with the diocese to minister to and amongst the Native American peoples. And I think there was a, a real fear at the time that, uh, that the people could easily be lost. And, and so to establish a diocese with that, min, that mission of ministering to and amongst the Native American peoples. But we, we've had uh, the presence of the church has been here since we know at least 1539, uh, eight years after Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared in St. Juan Diego, an indigenous person. Uh, we know that mass was first celebrated at the Zuni Pueblo. And that is uh, just, just south of Gallup on the uh, New Mexico side. So it's Northeast Arizona, Northwest New Mexico, Two states, 62% of the lands are Native American lands, and we have seven distinctive Native American tribes uh, throughout the whole diocese. And the largest and probably the best known for, to most people would be the Navajo mm -hmm. uh, Reservation, mm -hmm. the Navajo Nation, and that's half Arizona, half New Mexico. That's why we're, we're, in, we're in two states. I think that's so beautiful, and it's an issue that means a lot to me as a Mexican Catholic. Is this a heart issue for you as well? Is this something you're very passionate about and why it was given to you for pastoral care? It is. It is. I was, I was born on the reservation. I'm not Native American myself, but I was born on the reservation. My father was a teacher and a football coach, and uh, my family lived in Chinle, Arizona, which is in the northeast part of the, the state of, of Arizona, but on the, on the, on the Navajo Reservation. And uh, that's also where my family became Catholic. And, and so it is something that's very near and dear to my heart. 
Uh, I grew up in the Diocese of Phoenix. And in, in the United States, and this is probably something that, that's, that gets lost a little bit, you have more people who would be considered um, uh, urban Indians or urban Native Americans, uh, people who are living off the reservation, living in, in large uh, uh, metropolitan areas. And so even in the Diocese of Phoenix, you have lots of people who are Native Americans in the city, but then the city is also surrounded by uh, reservation lands, too. So you have a lot of Native Americans there. And so uh, being born on the reservation, growing up around Native American peoples, and then returning back to the, the diocese about 12 and a half years ago uh, to serve as the fourth bishop, this is something that's very, very, very near and dear to my heart. Sort of a homecoming for you. What, do you, see as, what do you see as the greatest challenges ahead for the Native American Catholic community, knowing it so well? And how would you encourage the church to engage with them? Well, I, I, a couple of years ago, we had a listening session with the, the bishops for the subcommittee for Native American Affairs, which I, which I chair. And we had a, a listening session, and that's simply what we wanted it to be. We wanted to bring uh, Catholic Native American leaders from around the country uh, together. We had a, a meeting in Phoenix, and uh, we wanted to listen to them. And so I, I would say one of, there were two things that came up that re really stood out to me. One is uh, they, they, they felt like they didn't have a voice, and that was important for us to be able to give them voice, and that's why it was important for us to simply have a, a listening session to hear them. And then the other thing that was really important is we needed to update a, our pastoral letter from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops because the last one that we had, we had, uh, had, had written and passed was from 1977. And if mm. you think about all the things that have happened. That was just, you know, 10, 10, you know, 13 years after the council. That's right. That was when that's Paul VI right. was still the Pope. I mean, there was, there's been a lot that's, that's happened. And uh, even think about the, the, the connection with uh, Pope St. John Paul II. And he had a great love for the indigenous people, spoke to the indigenous people in 1987 in, in Phoenix. And so there's been a lot that's taken place since then. And so we needed to update that. So there was a, a bit of a fear amongst the people that they, their voice wasn't being heard and they were being lost, and which is sad. We don't want that to happen because they're the first to hear the good news in the new world. So we, we want to make sure that they uh, uh, have, a, have a, a seat at the table, that their voice is heard, um, and then uh, that they, they, they're an integral part of the church. Well, talking about bringing people into the church and keeping them there, the Canadian bishops recently apologized for scandals at historic Indian residential schools. What else is the church doing to address historical abuses, to foster reconciliation, and to recognize indigenous culture? When we had our, our listening session, that was a, also a topic that came up that was very, very important. And I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to be transparent. That's a, that's a, a very good word. But the other thing is, all things must be brought into the light. And so if there's uh, pain, hardship, difficulty, mm -hmm. abuse, whatever the case might be in the past, uh, we can't sweep it under the rug. We can't pretend like it, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, happen. We have to bring it into the light. And that light that we bring it to is the light of Christ. And so if there's any pain or hardship or difficulties or whatever, uh, we allow the light of the gospel, the light of Christ to shine on it. And that's what's going to bring about healing. That's what's going to allow us to move forward uh, as the church that our, that our Lord established and intended us to be. And so um, everything has to be brought to the light. And we really can't be afraid to address issues, even the, the, the tough issues. And uh, so I, I, was, I was really heartened to see the, uh, the, the statement that came out of, uh, the, from the Canadian bishops. And um, within our own pastoral plan that we're working on right now, uh, we are also addressing that issue that's very, very important to us. Well, that's very encouraging. The church also draws from the Native American community for great saints, like Saint Kateri Takawitha, who just became a saint in 2012. And that speaks to the important role Native Americans and indigenous play in the body of the universal church. Why is it so important to have those examples? We, we, um, we're a church of saints, right? We're, we're sinners here, and we all want to be saints. And so I think it, it's really important for us to have somebody like a Saint, Saint Kateri or Saint Kateri um, that the Native American people can simply say, this is, this is one of our own. So she's the first declared 
a Native American saint. And uh, she's very, very inspiring. And, and we have um, cattery circles all around the, around the country where Native Americans come together and they, they grow in their, their Catholic faith. And, and the icon for them is, uh, is, is St. Cattery. We have other people we're looking at who causes are moving forward. Uh, the Floridian Martyrs, we have mm -hmm. uh, probably somebody very well known. It would be um, uh, Nicholas Black Elk uh, from uh, South Dakota, and his his cause is starting to move forward too. He was a he was a uh, a layman. He was a catechist, and that's something that's be becoming even more important uh, recently with some of the things that our Holy Father has put forward, calling people to that that, uh, that, that to to be catechist in the church. And um, so that, I think it's really important. And then we also have Native American or non-Native Americans that are important uh, to the Native American people. Somebody like uh, Saint uh, uh, Rose Philippine Duchesne, right? Um, Saint Catherine Drexel, who had a great love for the Native American people. She, she's a reason probably why we are a diocese, along with Pius Pius XII. Um, we have the uh, the North American martyrs: Isaac Job, John de Brebeuf. Uh, St. Rene, we have these uh, great Jesuits who, who ministered to and amongst the Native American peoples and, and essentially gave their life for the sake of the gospel so that they could, they could come to know the truth. And so we have some great saints out there. Great and, saints um, and great examples. I know the Shrine of the North American Martyrs is something that we encourage everyone to visit. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Bishop, so they're, they're, we're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for your explanation of this and for the hope that you've given us that there is more that we can do and more ways that we can engage. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for all the good work that you do. Up next on EWTN News In Depth, a very personal take on religious persecution. Some of the worst atrocities against religious minorities are carried out in China against the Uyghur Muslims, taken from the streets and thrown into detention centers. A Uyghur, now an American citizen, joins us to tell us his story and his plea for human rights in his homeland. A freeze on leisure travel to the U.S. is about to end as borders with Canada and Mexico are about to reopen for legal visitors vaccinated against COVID. And later, the beauty of a very special art exhibit at the Vatican. We'll tell you what's being done here for the first time in 500 years. EWTN News In Depth will be back in a moment. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. The world is keeping a close eye on China after earlier this week the communist regime sent a record number of military aircraft into Taiwan's air defense zone and ramped up rhetoric of bringing Taiwan back under its control. The United States policy has been to provide political and military support for Taiwan, but there is no outright promise to defend it from attack. We're urging Beijing to cease this military, diplomatic and economic pressure and the coercion against the Taiwan. We have an abiding interest in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, and that's why we're going to continue to assist Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense capability. China continues to tighten its grip on Internet censorship, which forced tech giant Microsoft to shut down its LinkedIn website in China on Thursday. Microsoft will launch a China-specific version of LinkedIn later this year for job searching, but it won't have social media features. Platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Google have been blocked in China for more than a decade. LinkedIn was the last major U.S. social network still operating in the country. An alarming ongoing injustice is China's censorship of religion. The U.S. Commission of International Religious Freedom's annual report found that religious freedom conditions in China are quickly deteriorating. The report indicates the Chinese government continues to detain millions of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in internment camps. Former detainees have reported torture, rape, sterilization and other abuses while in custody. A Uyghur Muslim American who's fighting for religious freedom in China and raising awareness about human rights issues there joins us next. Nuri Turkel was born in a detention center during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. He made his way to the United States in 1995 as a student. The U.S. later granted him asylum. He is now the vice chair of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Turkel is respected, a respected opinion leader and a foreign policy expert, primarily focusing on diplomatic, economic, and national security issues involving China, Central Asia, and Turkey, who confers often with other leading voices. Nuri Turkel joins us on the record. 
Nuri, thank you so much for being here today with us. This thank is you very much for having me on. An incredible thing for you, your story coming here from China. Tell us a little bit about what it was like. I never thought that I would be even talking about the, uh, the condition, the circumstances that my parents brought me to this world. Uh, I thought that we'd, I would never talk about the re-education camps as the way that I have been in the last two, two three uh, years in particular, uh, starting early 2018. And I never thought that the international community will stay silent on, in the face of the, the egregious human rights violations, religious persecution uh, ongoing, uh, underway in communist China. And I'm particularly uh, disappointed uh, by uh, some Western leaders around the world that they still don't have a clear vision how to deal with this looming threat posed by Beijing on religious freedom, human rights issues, even in civil liberties. Mm -hmm. The people who care for human rights, religious freedom, or claim to care about these issues should take a stance. It's, it's just, uh, you know, it's past time for action. Nuri, when was the last time you saw your parents? I was able to see my parents uh, here in Washington in 2004. When 2004? They, yeah, when they were here for my law school graduation. And then uh, I had a chance to briefly spend a week uh, with my father in late 2014. But I have not been able to see my mother, who gave birth to me in a re-education camp uh, for uh, almost uh, 17, 18 years now. That's a long time not to see your family. You do a lot of work on the International Commission, um, and, and your religious freedom work is front and center. Tell us a little bit about that experience and that platform that you were given, also being named one of the time people of the year, Time Magazine team People of the Year. I, it's, been an, uh, it's been an amazing experience for me. Um, uh, this, uh, my appointment, uh, my ability to serve in this commission uh, speaks the best of America. I mm. came here as an immigrant, uh, granted asylum, as you noted. And uh, I often say that, you know, I'm a kid from Kashgar, but here I am serving in the U.S. government uh, in this capacity. And not only to speak uh, for the Uyghur Muslims who've been persecuted and subject to genocide in communist China, but also lending my voice to those who have not been heard enough, uh, other uh, persecuted religious minorities around the world. So this job, this, uh, this opportunity has given me a chance to speak uh, uh, with foreign government officials, uh, directly address a U.S. government's concern, and encouraging them to do the right thing. Uh, one of the key messages I've been able to convey is that Religious freedom should be respected and should not be used um, as an, uh, religious persecution should not be used as an excuse uh, to achieve so-called social stability, uh, should not be politicized. Wherever the religious freedom is respected, that very stability can be naturally achieved. And also uh, the countries like ours uh, where religious freedom is respected. Uh, can be a prosperous country, mm. uh, can be a respected country. Uh, so those are kind of basic messages uh, that we have been able to convey to our interlocutors in various government offices, including embassies here in Washington, D.C. And also we also been, uh, have been also uh, been helping to explain that the United States religious freedom agenda is not uh, promoting one religion over another. Mm -hmm. We are promoting uh, international standards, uh, UN Declaration on Human Rights as, as a foundation for religious uh, freedom, religious yeah. liberty. Uh, so that, that is one message coming from me as an immigrant, as a, as some, as a member of an oppressed uh, religious minority group, uh, resonated in some groups. Because there's so much disinformation has been uh, put out uh, by regimes like the Iranians and right. the North Korean, the, the Russians and the Chinese. So, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. So uh, it, it's an important uh, job. It's been an it's been, uh, amazing experience for me. And it's been privilege. Uh, it's been privilege. And I've worked with amazing bipartisan uh, members, uh, commissioners, uh, who may not be able to agree on anything, but when it comes to religious freedom, religious liberty, we are almost symbiotic. That's fantastic. And it's true. Religious freedom is not a political football. It's not a political tool. It's a human right. right. And you advocate for it in this way. You use the word genocide. Tell us a little bit about the allegations that have been made toward China in terms of rape, imprisonment, et cetera, of these religious minorities. Uh, are these allegations true? What can you share? The um, naming or calling a country or government out for uh, genocidal actions is not a, uh, a, a easy decision. Mm -hmm. 
and it, that the word genocide should not be and it could not be uh, lightly used. The United States government, the previous administration, uh, took a long time to look at various uh, evidence uh, publicly available and also witness testimonies and also uh, the information available within our government to uh, determine that there is an ongoing genocide uh, actions, genocidal actions against the Uyghur people. There are four key legal requirements. Uh, I think at least three of them uh, meets uh, three of the conditions uh, that is happening today as we speak meets the legal requirement for genocide. That includes uh, separation of children from their uh, separating children from their family members, uh, attempt to destroy in part or whole of this ethnic group, mm. and also includes uh, forced sterilization of Uyghur women. Yes. We're talking about Uyghur women who are in her uh, middle uh, mi uh, middle aged Uyghur woman. I've interviewed a number of Uyghurs who have been subjected to forced sterilization. One of them happy to be uh, happened to be 50 year old woman wow. who has been in the news. So uh, so those are the uh, key aspects of the, um, uh, the ongoing genocide that the United States government, the previous administration, rightfully determined as a genocide, and uh, the current administration confirmed uh, through public statements and annual human rights report, annual religious freedom report, that it is an ongoing genocide. So we are at the, at, at the juncture of uh, coming up with a coherent policy responses, mm -hmm. uh, real actions to stop this genocide and hold, to, hold those to account. Let me highlight something very important uh, on the genocide conversation. The, the oftentime, uh, the opinion leaders, reporters, uh, policy experts, legislators focus on one key issue, if it is a genocide or not. Mm -hmm. That is important, but they often forget the Article 1 of the Genocide Convention, which requires state parties to the genocide to call it out, uh, call out the, uh, the bad actors, perpetrators, right. stop it, and punish them. Right. So that is one aspect that has been uh, under-discussed, not been fully appreciated. So it's time for us, uh, people who are in, um, in various uh, positions, uh, even uh, ordinary citizens, uh, policy makers to and come companies. up. Yeah, companies, uh, absolutely, American businesses, um, uh, to come up with a coherent uh, policy responses and, and actions to stop this genocide. Otherwise, the never again vow that we've been told uh, through our education or hearing on a regular basis will be a meaningless uh, slogan. That's right. I have one last question for you, Nuri, and that's just about the Uyghur population in general. Why them? Why them specifically? Why did the Chinese government target them? That is an excellent question. This is one of the common questions that people often ask. Um, the easy answer is that uh, one of the easiest answer, answer for me uh, as, as a Uyghur who yeah. Are, uh, who happen to be part of this ethnic group who's been subject to China's genocidal campaign, that the Chinese uh, government often view uh, Uyghur's ethno-religious identity as a, as a sign of disloyalty mm. to the Communist Party, Communist ideology, because religious belief does not go in hand in hand or goes on the face of the Communist ideology, number one. Number two, the Chinese authorities always believe uh, that uh, specifically Western religion, Christianity and, and Islam uh, uh, will pose a political threat mm. to the stability of the Communist Party. So, and then uh, we also have to talk about the racist aspect of the right. ongoing uh, genocide, because the Chinese, you have to listen to what they say uh, in addition to paying attention to what they do. They call uh, Uyghur Islam as a mental illness, uh, believing in uh, or following spiritual life as a sign of uh, thought virus or showing the sign of thought virus. They also use the terms like you have to take out the weed. Um, uh, you cannot take out the weed one by one. You have to spray chemical. Wow. They also use the terminology such as transformation. Transformation is a code word for um, uh, communist regime in particular. Uh, when they're waging war on religion. Wow. Transformation is, is cleansing, social, cleansing uh, yeah, re human re-engineering. Re mm -hmm. So they essentially wanted to wipe out all the religious values, religious belief, spirituality out of your mind and replace with the communist ideology. And the other reasons also can be discussed. Uh, China's geopolitical interest and Xi Jinping's ambition 
and you know China's Communist Party leadership uh, uh, as, uh, you know, assessment of the potential world, uh, international community's response, because they worked so hard in the last three, uh, three decades to buy out silence from the international community. That's right. And we're going to keep talking about that with the panel that's coming up right after you. We're so grateful, Nuri, for your incredible witness. And I know that our viewers are going to be praying for you and your family. But we're also going to be following everything that you do very closely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Nuri. Thank you. We continue the conversation about religious persecution around the world, how both governments and big business are responding to put the pressure on, and what else they could and should be doing. Our expert panel joins me next. Global government restrictions on religion remain high, social hostility is down, and Christians remain the most persecuted religious group in the world, according to the Pew Research Center. As we continue our look at global religious persecution on EWTN News In Depth, we break down the most recent report from Pew. The organization analyzed data in 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic began. The report covers 198 countries and territories and indicates that government restrictions involving religion rose to 57 countries, or 29 percent, matching the study's highest mark from 2012. The countries shown here in red are areas of higher restrictions, including Russia, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Algeria. Restric restrictions can include a lack of national laws on freedom of religion, limits on religious literature, restrictions on wearing religious symbols, and whether the government displays physical violence toward minority religious groups. The report did show a decline in social hostilities related to religion in 2019, down to 43 countries from 53 the year prior. Those hostilities include harassment over attire for religious reasons, to mob violence, to terrorism. Christians and Muslims, the world's largest and most widely dispersed religious groups, experienced harassment in more countries than other religious groups in 2019, according to Pew Research. To provide context on how both governments and corporations are responding to countries where religious persecution is rampant, we're joined by Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, a now retired U.S. Foreign Service officer who began his diplomatic career in 1983. He's currently vice president of the Middle East Media Research Institute. And Nathan Estreth, former vice president of Procter & Gamble. He has led business development and global supply teams. He currently chairs Genesis Software Innovations. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Alberto, we we just heard from Nuri Turkel, who told us of the horrible treatment of a Muslim minority community in China. How has this reality impacted foreign policy? Well, I would uh, I would posit that it hasn't uh, impacted foreign policy enough. Hmm. One of the great dangers, I think, uh, in an issue like uh, religious persecution or religious freedom, is what I call the checklist problem in foreign policy, which is for administrations. It's on the list, but it's on the list somewhere along a, a spectrum or a grid of many problems. And so often it gets rated to second or third or 10th or 20th uh, or, or worse on that list of priority issues. We saw that very graphically recently, for example, in uh, an exchange that occurred with uh, former Secretary of State Kerry where they talked to him about climate change and he you know he basically said climate change is more important than than the genocide of the Uyghurs. So I think that's a big problem in foreign policy is uh, government relations uh, also true on obviously on the economic side almost always take priority over these issues of of freedom, of freedom of speech, of freedom of thought. And that's a big problem in foreign policy. And Alberto, why is that? I mean, in other situations, the U.S. has acted more aggressively to stop human rights violations. What do you propose as the issue here? Well, I mean, to be frank, one of the challenges is that governments, especially Western governments, have a broad range of issues that they can engage with counterparts on. So. The, the air is sucked out of the room, you know, based on a handful of issues. And you can't beat up or you can't uh, confront uh, bad actors about everything. So you pick and choose. This gives bad actors, like the uh, People's Republic of China and Iran and others, the opportunity to kind of play against the West on these issues, you know, is, uh, you know, we want certain economic things, you want certain uh, uh, 
uh, certain levels of, of engagement, well, there's a price, and the price is play down these issues related to human rights, play down these issues related to freedom. So what is needed is to be more aggressive, I would say more proactive and more creative in looking for ways to advance um, a human rights and a religious freedom agenda within foreign policy. And those creative solutions might come from the business community. Nathan, you know business. What can and should companies do in stopping human rights violations? Should the values of their suppliers affect where and how they do business? Montse, thank you for having me. And I think the simple answer is absolutely it should. You know, Ambassador Fernandez mentioned the checklist problem for international relations with governments. The problem we have with corporations is advancing religious freedom is not even on the checklist. Uh, we first need to make it a criteria and help corporations understand that uh, within their values, they value their employees, they value the men and women on their supply lane lines and with their suppliers. But the most important way that they can do that is to actually consider where they do operate, where they place plants, how they choose suppliers. And we have a moment in time as almost every multinational country in the world is re-looking at their supply lines, supply chains at this time, and looking for building redundancy and resiliency to take into account, are we operating and choosing suppliers and plant locations in countries that advance religious freedom or that undermine it? And Nathan, for, co for companies, is this an issue of community where they just haven't come together to make this a priority? Is it an issue of formation? Why isn't this happening? You know, uh, companies, I think, are in a different place than governments in that they're having to work with each individual government on the ground as uh, they advance their business goals. And so, yes, they have been largely heads down. And so first, I think it starts from a movement within companies to say we need to add religious freedom as a filter as we look at the resiliency of our supply chains. This is in our shareholders' best interest, our employees' best interest. And then, yes, it will take a coordinated approach of companies working together. And we have an example where companies have done this, even in the last decade, on sustainability, where they started taking into account elements within their supply chain and how it impacted local and global environments. And they have changed many things working in concert. Religious freedom needs to be that next filter. And we have the moment in time to do it right now as everyone is re-looking at supply chains. Absolutely. Alberto, over the summer, Microsoft announced that they're working with other web giants and the United Nations on a database to block potential extremist content. But the definition of extremist seems vague. Does this give you pause? Yes, it does. I mean, the track record of social media companies uh, on this issue is very, uh, how should I put it, diplomatically spotty. Um, you know, um, you see tyrants, for example, like uh, President Xi of, uh, of China or the dictator of Iran or, or the dictator of, of Cuba, you know, on social media, and yet you see some, you know, let alone American politicians or some some you know minor person being thrown off for what seems like very very obscure reasons. So the whole question of extremism is a very fluid question, and it gives me a great a great deal of concern because we've seen so much so recently how it's been abused. And by the way, it's also used as a tool by by. Uh, these dictatorships. I mean, what did the, the Chinese, when they persecute the Uyghurs, what did they say? They say, we're fighting extremism. So, so that's, um, that, that's something that is very concerning. Well, we've watched Facebook admitting that they promoted anti-Muslim violence in Myanmar. How can they be trusted to discern what is extremist and what isn't, Alberto? I, I don't think companies can. I don't think, uh, you know, social media companies uh, can be trusted with such awesome power. I think uh, the, what we've seen over the past few years is that they have too much power. And uh, I think there needs to be some happy medium. Uh, there's a concern also about basically having government make certain decisions. And I'm, I tend to lean towards the, you know, pro-freedom of expression side, pro-dissent side, even pro, 
a speech that is sometimes unpleasant or, or bad speech. But, um, but if we're going to fight extremism in the digital realm, it has to be done with nuance and with sensitivity and intelligence and involve not just these, uh, these tech giants, these robber barons of the 21st century, but government and also stakeholders, I think, in society uh, in, is in issues like religious freedom or freedom of thought or dissent. Nathan, China's social credit system is a combination of government and business surveillance that gives citizens a score that can restrict the ability of individuals to take actions like purchase plane tickets or get a credit loan because of certain behaviors or beliefs. Are we seeing the beginnings of this in the U.S.? Well, we certainly uh, certainly have examples uh, that it looks like it could be starting, Monse, and I think uh, it's up to every individual citizen, but also corporations and uh, government, local, state, and federal, to push back on this. And I, I agree with uh, the ambassador that um, the signs are concerning, and leaving it in the hands of uh, just tech uh, clearly is uh, fraught with peril. You know, there, there is a level of moral incoherence that we see from companies as they stay in their silos and work with individual governments. And it's one that uh, does not match with the values that many companies uh, purport to believe, which is human dignity, human rights, religious freedom of their employees and those of their suppliers. Yet for uh, the quarterly results or short-term results, they're able uh, to somehow justify it in their mind. And it, you know, it's not justifiable, it's morally incoherent. And so bringing together folks to talk about this, both government and companies, I think is a very important next step to uh, establish some of these benchmarks and embed them in supply chains uh, to help companies become more morally coherent in how they serve their customers and delight their shareholders. And Nathan, where might they do that? You know, there's a, uh, a great um, example of that. Ambassador Brownback has graciously uh, sponsored um, a group that has been meeting now. We met at the International Religious Freedom Conference that Ambassador Brownback uh, sponsored in July in, in Washington, D.C. And next week, there is a follow-on conference with a number of these large companies, including some of the tech companies, saying, we do need to do something here. It's on uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And anyone that knows someone in these companies or might be in these companies can reach out to info at 1792exchange.com, 1792exchange.com, and uh, just let them know if you would like to participate in that. It's a virtual conference, easy to join, and it's talking about these very things of how companies can start to use their supply chains to advance religious freedom. Well, we hope that they will, and we'll take the advice from Alberto and from you, Nathan, to our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monte. And an important message on acceptance of others, different from ourselves, came this week from Pope Francis. Christian freedom means respecting other cultures and traditions, rather than imposing one's own model of life as the most appealing. That was the Holy Father's message at his weekly general audience as he continued to reflect on St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. The Pope reminded us that the meaning of the word Catholic is universal, reflecting the openness with which we should respect the cult cultural origin of every person. The Week in Review is next, including the Pope and the President. Their meeting is confirmed and mixed opinions about the Biden choice to be the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. I said from the very beginning that we are going to defend uh, pro-life laws mm -hmm. and all our laws uh, and exhaust all avenues to do so all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. And we'll tell you what the Kentucky Attorney General says about his state's argument at the U.S. Supreme Court this week that could reopen an important abortion case. Confirmation from the White House of the first official presidential meeting between Joe Biden and Pope Francis. That news tops the week in review. The papal audience to include First Lady Jill Biden will happen on October 29th at the Vatican. These pictures show then Vice President Biden meeting with Pope Francis in April of 2016. Their meeting at the end of this month will be in conjunction with the president's trip to Europe for the G20 summit, beginning in Rome the following day. A White House statement said the agenda will include discussions about working together to end the COVID pandemic, tackle the climate crisis, and caring for the poor. 
The White House has announced its choice for ambassador to the Holy See. Former U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly of Indiana served in the Senate from 2013 to 2019. Before that, as a pro-life Catholic Democrat in the House, he was a strong foe of abortion funding. But in the Senate, he reversed his position and voted to support federal funding for Planned Parenthood. His voting record has led to mixed reactions to his nomination. The president of the University of Notre Dame, where Donnelly is an alum and former professor, called him an ideal choice whose Catholic faith informs his understanding of the role the church can play in the world. This week, Pope Francis presided over the Mass at the opening of the Synod on Synodality. During a two-year process, bishops around the world, including in dioceses across the United States, will consult with the faithful, from parishioners to nuns and monks to Catholic schools and institutions, to gather feedback about the Church. Several dioceses in the U.S. are planning several opening Masses this weekend. Pope Francis has asked this consultation be incorporated into church governance, which will be discussed during the 16th Synod of Bishops in 2023. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, EWTN News Executive Editor and Washington Bureau Chief, joins us now to help explain. Matthew, what is the 16th Synod of Bishops, and what did Pope Francis say his ex expectations were for going forward with this multi-year process? Well, this is, as you say, the 16th ordinary session. In other words, this is the one that's uh, customarily scheduled. We've had some uh, special synods over the last few years, including the one on the Amazon. Mm. Uh, this one, however, is under the somewhat unique title of the Synod on Synodality, which has become, I think, one of the pillars of Pope Francis's pontificate. And that is going back to the idea of a synod as a journey to Together. And the theme, of course, is communion, participation, and mission for the church going forward. So he wants to see everything from the church being listened to as the bishops are gathering. So one of the hallmarks of his pontificate has been the peripheries, the periferia. He wants to make sure that every voice is heard as we head into what is going to be a synod on sort of how the church is being in communion, how there is participation, and especially how we are a church of mission. So we heard earlier about Native Americans. We're talking about religious minorities. So the church going out and then coming back to have a discussion. Why have some called this process risky or controversial? Well, it's risky uh, from the sense that uh, the process itself, as we have seen in the so-called German synodal path, which is something else entirely different from the actual synod of bishops, uh, has been hijacked at times by groups with their own agenda. That's something that we need to be aware of, uh, especially in this German process. Uh, uh, Cardinal Mario Grech, who's the head of the synod of bishops who runs all of this, uh, has been going to some pains to point out that the, the German synodal path or way is not the same thing as the synod of bishops, that this is going to be the more formal structure that we have in place for the synod of bishops, and that their definition of synodality is Francis's, something that Francis himself pointed out to the Germans when he called on them uh, not to follow their synodal way, but to follow his synodal path, which again is that communion, participation, and mission, not to trying to dismantle, apparently, uh, key fundamental teachings of the church. Many are watching this German, German synodal way with a little bit of fear. And how, how is that process that opened last weekend in Rome different from what is happening in the German church? Well, it's different in part because it is also universal. Uh, Pope Francis uh, is determined to have this conversation on synodality, on that journeying together of the church, but he wants to make sure that it happens under the communion, under Pope Francis's direction, and uh, with the clear authority that it brings uh, from the Synod of Bishops separate from what the Germans are doing. One of the great opportunities here, again, is for everyone in the church to be heard, uh, but again, to have that guidance uh, of the Holy See in this endeavor, again, bringing people together in communion, not at the risk, as the Germans have, of creating further division within the church coming together under the true understanding of the teaching of the church. Thank you so much, Matthew. Good to be with you. Momentum this week at the U.S. Supreme Court that might allow a rehearing of a Kentucky abortion case at the federal district court level. On EWTN's Pro-Life Weekly with host Catherine Hadro, Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron discussed this week's oral arguments in front of the high court, in which the state is asking that he be allowed to reopen the defense of a Kentucky abortion law. The law, passed in 2018, bans dismemberment abortions in the second trimester. It was overturned by a federal district court, struck down before Cameron, a Republican, was elected. The question for the U.S. Supreme Court is not the constitutionality of the law itself, but rather if Cameron, as attorney general, has standing to intervene in the case. Here is Justice Stephen Breyer commenting during this week's oral argument. 
Uh, look, there have been a lot of party changes. First the Republicans are in, then the Democrats are in, and they have different views on an abortion statute. At that point, for the first time, we have an attorney general who thinks it's a pretty good statute. He wants to defend it. So two days after he learns that nobody's going to defend it, he comes in and says, let's me defend it. And that's okay under Kentucky law, apparently. I think based on whether it was Justice Breyer's comments or, or the questions that he posed, even other justices, I think they are seriously uh, wrestling with the idea of state sovereignty and who has the authority to make a determination about how uh, a state can defend its law. As he explained on Pro-Life Weekly, if the justices side with Cameron, the case goes back to the federal appeals court to reconsider the constitutionality of Kentucky's pro-life law. An update now on a story we told you about several weeks ago. A federal judge has issued a preliminary injunction on New York State's COVID vaccine mandates for health workers who hold religious objections. New York State allowed medical exemptions but did not allow anyone to even file for a religious exemption. 17 health care workers sued the state. Judge David Hurd in Utica wrote that there is no adequate explanation for defendants about why the reasonable accommodation that must be extended to a medically exempt health care worker could not similarly be extended to a health care worker with a sincere religious objection. We spoke with attorney Steve Crampton, the lawyer for the health care workers, who says the injunction doesn't just impact his clients, but all medical workers in New York. The judge has made it very clear that the injunction applies across the board. Whether they're our clients or not, they are entitled uh, to apply for this religious exemption and employers must honor those. The state of New York has already declared it will appeal. There's no trial date set yet. A decision could come by December about a promising antiviral pill to treat COVID-19. Pharmaceutical company Merck has officially asked the FDA to authorize the use of the pill. Its research shows the pill can cut hospitalizations and deaths by half among patients with early symptoms of COVID. Health officials stress the pill is not a substitute for getting vaccinated. The FDA said its outside experts will meet in late November to discuss the request, giving them time to review Merck's findings. After more than a year and a half of COVID-related border closures, these familiar old scenes at the U.S. borders with Mexico and Canada could be returning soon. The Biden administration announced this week travel restrictions will ease beginning in November for fully vaccinated legal visitors at the land borders. That's when similar rules will go into effect for air travel into the country. Both Mexico and Canada have pressed the U.S. for months to ease restrictions that have separated families and curtailed leisure trips since the onset of the pandemic. A follow-up on that California crude oil spill we told you about earlier this month. On Thursday, the Coast Guard announced the leak off the coast of Orange County is smaller than initially calculated. They now estimate about 25,000 gallons of oil, or one-fifth the amount they feared, gushed into the ocean after a break in an underwater oil pipeline, likely caused by a ship anchor. While workers are still combing the sand for tar balls, Huntington and Newport beaches have reopened. People on Social Security are about to get larger checks in the biggest cost of living adjustment in nearly 40 years. Checks will jump by 5.9 percent for an average of $92 a month. Nearly 70 million Social Security beneficiaries will see boosts in their checks starting in January. The increase reflects inflation and rising prices for food, gas and other goods and services recipients are already paying. About 25 percent of seniors live in households where Social Security provides all or nearly all of their monthly income. Up next, we take you to a special art exhibit at the Vatican, a look at rarely seen masterpieces from the Pope's apartment at the Apostolic Palace. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. It's been 500 years in the making, but now a new exhibit at the Vatican Museums brings together, after centuries, the original drawings, sketches, and paintings of two great works of art. The depictions of Saints Peter and Paul, the patrons of Rome, were begun by Brother Bartholomew, a Dominican friar who completed the panel of Saint Paul. He was unable to paint the other panel, and a young artist named Raphael stepped in to paint the depiction of Saint Peter.
We know now, of course, that Raphael went on to become one of the greatest artists of all time. These masterworks have been in the papal apartment for decades, not seen by the general public. Enjoy the exhibit. St. Peter is on the left in our Images of the Week. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. We hope you'll join us again same time next week as we continue our exploration of our Catholic life together. See you then.